Um, you know, I've been talking about how lucky we are to have these amazing local experts right here in our backyard. And our next presentation gives you an opportunity to just absorb some of the knowledge and the passion and the love that these local experts bring to our community. Sandra and Matt are part of our Thrive Steering Committee and they contributed to the development of the initiative you just saw. They're, they're contributing to the development of the support materials, they're in the videos, and they honestly do pour endless time into the health and well-being of our community, not just on the clock, but around the clock. I am not going to take up any more time. You've already had an opportunity to see them and meet them. I'm going to turn it right over to Sandra Azevedo and Matt Redham. Thank you so much for joining us today and take it away. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So we didn't plan this. But, but we do look like the Wonder Twins, for those of you who are old <laughs> enough, like they put their fists together and they're like, in the form of great presentation. Whee! Um, so, well, that's embarrassing. Now, I have, I guarantee you, if Sandra stood up, she didn't have dirty sweats on like some of us, this guy. I do, actually. <laughs> See, this is it's sad, but also awesome. Um, okay, do we, are we doing, do you need me to do the PowerPoint or are you guys doing, I can do it, maybe? I think. I can do it if you'd like. I have it up. Yes, if you have it up, that'd be great. I didn't have it, didn't have it ready. Yeah. Pull it up. I know so many people on here. This is amazing. I haven't seen some of the faces I've seen on here in quite a long time. So it's pretty amazing. All right. All right. Is it up? Can you guys see it? You got it. All right, take it away, Sandra, you wanna start us off? Sure, let's go ahead and do a, a actually um, what I'd like to do is uh, kind of change a couple things. First is to do a check-in in the chat box and ask you guys if you wouldn't mind sharing how you're feeling right now. And then also I'd like you to answer this question on a scale of one to five. If five is a really strong positive and one is weak, how do you, would you say the people in your community, in your organization, in your family are feeling about the need to talk to other people right now? So a five would be they really um, enjoy, need, crave talking to other people right now. And a one would be that they don't. I'm seeing fives and fives and fives, few fours and threes. Yeah, yeah. So Matt's gonna provide some context about this um, in terms of the campfire and stuff, but I wanted to make a couple connections before we jump in. Um, I have all these sticky notes from this morning and Dr. Christina Bethel talked about uh, sharing ideas and talking about things that matter as part of positive childhood experiences. And if we wanna provide those with our children, um, we need to practice those as adults. She also talked about going from fixing to connecting and having that mutual listening experience. And Dr. Laura Porter talked about the need for dialogue, emotional connection and intentional listening. And Junie talked about relationships are at the heart of what we do. And Junie also talked about the plunger and I was working on the metaphor and you'll have to help me out here, Junie, but I'm thinking that today when we talk about building a container for listening, that that might be like a community bathroom, right? So, so how are we gonna build a community bathroom so that we can engage in our emotional literacy? So I, I just really appreciated this morning and all of the context that all of the speakers brought to the need um, for us to have dialogue spaces. So I'm gonna go ahead and let Matt start on that. If you can go to the next slide. Okay, I'd like to start with a, a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Maidu Machupta people who have lived on this land time immemorial. We pay respects to their elders past and present Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, 
displacement, migration, forced resettlement that bring us together here today. We've recognized the resilience of those past and present and the resilience of the Maidu Machupta people who work to build a strong and sovereign nation where tribal members can live their values and culture. We encourage you to join us in uncovering such truths at any and all public events and in working to understand how we can better support the well being of the tribes whose land I am on and we are on today. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So uh, we, we did do a little check in right there. Um, if, if you feel comfortable just putting a single word in the chat about how you're feeling right now, that would be awesome. Um, there's this concept that I've heard referenced like 4 million times and everybody references that it originated with somebody else. I first heard it from Joyce Dorado. I think she might've heard it from Daniel Siegel, but it's, you have to name it to tame it, right? So you have to name and verbalize the ghosts and the pain and the overwhelm that is living inside you. And once you name it, now you have a different relationship with it. So we consider typing in chat to be a form of naming. <laughs> Okay, so we have a lot of different feelings. This is the first time in a long time, and I've talked to a lot of different people, a lot of different groups, really since the fire, but especially since COVID. And this is easily the most positive I have seen collectively people feel. And there's something to be said for that. And I think in many ways, we could begin and end this training by saying, look, we have a group of people, we're together, it's facilitated, it's safe, it's structured. Oh, look, people feel good. I, I want to make this really complicated about holding space and, and, and having space for folks, but it isn't. We as a people have been doing it for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years. So what we talk about today is not one of my ideas or one of Sanders' ideas or something that came from Dr. Perry or whatever. This, this is humanity. This is what we do when we experience crisis, when we experience interrelational and relational pain when the world comes at us in a way we are not prepared for, that that is the one thing that we know can exist after adversity and after trauma is our humanity. All right, next slide. So why, why do we do this? And we'll talk about holding space and we'll get into what it is. Simply put is having an environment, a space that folks can come and safely name and relate and borrow from one another's resilience. It is not complicated. But what we found, this, this really, the, the why is, has been stated throughout today, has been stated for the past five hours. I don't need to sell you the why anymore. There was a time early in my career when I had to stand in front of folks and hammer the why because the why wasn't agreed upon. What was agreed upon is, well, those kids don't try or those kids don't care. There was a lack of acknowledgement of the historical traumas, the historical realities that brought groups of people and communities and context to the place that they are. And so I had to provide data and I had to provide explanations and I had to quote sources. You know, if there's any silver lining to what we've all been through is I don't have to do that anymore. We all know the why. But the why is deeper than Butte County has been through a lot. Our society has been through a lot. Our globe has been through a lot. It is more than that. It is that within our community, we have incredible capacity to heal one another. We have not only professionals and experts within the community, but we have a collection of humans who love each other. And so after the campfire, many of us, especially in this field, didn't know what to do because we didn't have the capacity to feel we could bear the pain of others because a lot of us, if not all of us, were impacted as well. So one of the things that we started doing was up in Paradise, I started, they invited my folks from Trauma Transformed in the Bay Area, they came up and we, we sat in a circle at Chico Country Day School and we just had one prompt, which is how's everybody doing and we went around. 
And what we noticed in that moment and what I noticed as somebody who at that time was displaced and at that time was feeling the burden of this disaster, that there was something about being in the room with people who were aligned in the common cause of healing together, that it dawned on us that this is a really impactful and effective way to join in healing as one. And so as the year progressed, um, I, I did some of these groups and these circles up in paradise. I did them for different departments. I did them for staff. And we noticed that collectively, even when I was facilitating it, I left with the feeling that I could not get anywhere else. And it didn't mean that my pain was gone and it didn't mean that my fear was gone, but it meant that I did not feel isolated in my experience, which we know if there is one thing that is horrific for the traumatized individual, it is social isolation. And you can be socially isolated in a room full of people. If you feel your experience is not heard, is abnormal and is not okay, you will feel isolated and that is not good for your internal system. And so by being in a group, we discovered that the why was right in front of us because this is the most natural, human, um, consistent communal way that we can approach what we are all going through. And, and it's also a really great way to deliver psychoeducation in a way that doesn't make people yawn and wanna jump out the nearest window because we are all common in our understanding of why. Next slide. So it's time to face the truth of our situation that we are all in this together, that we all have a voice and figure out how to mobilize the hearts and minds of everyone in our workplaces and communities. And that's by Margaret Wheatley. So any intervention that leaves folks out is not an intervention that is benefiting all, right? That's obvious. And so when we look at individual interventions, which often after a disaster are necessary or often after adversity are necessary, what we found is people were much more likely to join in activities that involved community. And those folks that were facilitating groups either with me, alongside me, or doing it themselves also reported that the act of engaging in a facilitated process designed to increase healing was in and of itself healing for them. You know, I just did a bunch of these right when the latest round of fires came down on us and, you know, it was filled with smoke outside and I was the facilitator, but I'll tell you, again, I experienced, there is something sacred about doing that with folks. And that I felt this selfishness because I was benefiting as much, if not more than everybody that was sitting in, on that on that screen with me. And I was wondering what would happen to this if we did this virtually? Does it hold the same intensity and spirit? And it absolutely does. It absolutely does. All right, next slide. Sandra. Yeah, so, you know, what happened in our community recently when, you know, everybody's experiencing this stress is they they call us and they say can Matt come and talk to us and um, you know Matt can't go to every place so we want to be thinking about how can we build the capacity of other people to do this work and so this today is really just a snapshot of a training that we are working on we've done one and we're making some changes to it but we've included at the end in the resource section a slide deck to the entire um, original slide deck that has a bunch of resources. So I just want to share that with you that we're not really going to be able to do the, you know, the how today, but we just want to really focus on the why this is so important to learn to do and how we can start to build capacity for this. So the next slide. So Matt really talked a lot about what dialogue is, but we it's really about the intention of coming together for more understanding. It might be for healing. It might be to have conversations about race. It might be for learning. But how are we intentionally coming together um, to support one another and learn together? So the next slide. So dialogue spaces. And again, one of the, the 
aspects of this that we want to illuminate is that we are inviting our whole self into the room. And for years in many of our organizations and our spaces, that wasn't the case. We could only have our polite self and our unemotional self. So we want to create spaces where people can be their authentic self. And what can we do to, to be brave ourselves and help support a container that will help others be their authentic self? One of the things, Sandra, I just want to touch on, and I, I don't know if it goes here or not, but it's my brain and it'll leave, is, you know, this concept, we, we talk a lot about wellness right now. We're talking a lot about adult wellness and, and, and child wellness and social emotional learning. And this is a beautiful thing. This is a good thing. But we also have to acknowledge that traditionally, our systems, collectively, all of our systems, have believed and have given us the message that your time to heal, your time to talk about feelings, your time to acknowledge your inner life is not in at work. That that is a separate world and you're expected to enter into your system without that world tagging along. And if you have struggles and you have issues or you're feeling a tremendous amount of uh, adversity and pain, the traditional answer of the system is they take the folks that are most burdened by the work they're doing and tell them, go take care of yourself, go do self-care then, which for many people felt like a slight because many of what was causing them adversity and stress and overwhelm was the work that they were doing. And so dialogue spaces and holding space for dialogue is also an attempt to bridge the gap between the expectation that we don't have a life that we carry with us everywhere, that we can do this within our systems, not apart from our systems. Because to truly sustain our folks who are doing frontline work, which like we did with the teachers, this has to be woven into our system. This isn't something that's just good during crisis. This is something that's good for a system to bring the system together. And it is terrifying for many systems to imagine a world in which we do both, but I think it is integral. Thank you, Matt. All right, if you go to the next slide. So I love this framework. It comes from the National Equity Project Leadership for Equity Competencies, and that's a clickable link um, if you guys want the resources later. And it talks about these five different leadership competencies, and, and we are all leaders in this work. So at the top, above the green line, is those organizational aspects that we're really familiar with, like what do the adults and the children in our systems need to know, and what are the processes and teaming structures that we might do to make that happen. But below the green line, it emphasizes these relational um, competencies that we want adults to have. And those include things like how do I create and hold spaces for people to develop their identities, relationships, and capacity? And how do I cultivate my own self-awareness? And what do I stand for as a leader? And you know, what do we stand for as a system? So those below the green line things are, are um, what we need to lean into during times of complexity, during times of healing, and how can we start to make those more explicit and visible in um, our organizations and in our community. Okay. Next slide. So the how, we're gonna very quickly go through this. Go ahead and go to the next one. So Matt, do you wanna to speak to that? Yeah, in the absence of connectedness, even the best evidence-based interventions for mental health won't be effective. And that's our friend, Dr. Bruce Perry. Um, it's simple and I've touched on it, which is, you know, we th none of this impacts the physiological system, the human system, the relational system without a platform of relationship, right? It doesn't happen. For, for anything. I would argue any of our systems that that is true. And so the connectedness is at the center of this particular intervention. If there someday is evidence behind it, okay, great. But our focus is the connectedness and the relationship. Next slide. So, so oh, yeah, no. go ahead. No, no, you got it. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, 
so trying to dissect this in a way that we could uh, teach it to people, the way that we decided to do that was to break it down into these three elements, the building the container, aligning your attention and listening, and explicitly attending to the quality of relationships. And so in the longer slide and in the slide deck that you have access to, there's some resources and tools to do each one of those things. And I think this notion of building the container is something that um, we can all develop further. And uh, I do restorative practices and I think circle practice and the structure that can come from learning circles is a great way to get that practice and have that structure. But we want us to be thinking broadly about this and not just that this is a healing circle or restorative circle, but also just um, conversations that we're having with others about important things um, that we need to be having during this time. Mm -hmm. um, on the next slide, we can share a couple resources that are included. There is um, something called the Compassion Resilience Toolkit, and uh, it has resources for schools, health and human services, and parents and caregivers. And it is laid out, if you're one of those people that wants a roadmap, it is laid out lesson one, lesson two, scripts for circles, facilitator guides, it's all free, it's all online, and really highlights that compassion that we've heard so much about today. And then another resource in there when we think about listening, and uh, Dr. Bethel really talked about that deep listening, and there's an activity in there um, that illuminates how we might practice that. And the portrait up there is from um, Otto Scharmer's work around the four levels of listening. And it's how do we move from um, being open-minded to being open-hearted. And that's that empathic listening that many of us are familiar with uh, and, and think is where we wanna be. To, to moving beyond that, to having an open will and putting ourselves back into that space and saying, not only am I here to listen to you, but I'm, I'm bringing all of myself in and I'm willing to be changed by this experience. So I'm gonna be an active participant in that experience. So, the, so those are just some examples of some of the resources that we have listed there. Next slide. Matt, you want to talk about that? Yeah, so so, and this this speaks to what Jeanette just asked, which is, you know, we're also putting together some video examples and some other ways that we can demonstrate what this looks like. But I think one of the things as far as facilitating is if you aren't, don't come from a clinical background, it could be scary, the idea of facilitating a dialogue space. Um, and I understand and empathize with that fear. I believe everybody has this skill set, period. They all do. We're all part of systems and communal uh, systems and families. So we know how to facilitate even when we don't know we're doing it. But sometimes things can get tricky. And so we look at things like containment versus exploration. Like if somebody is struggling, do I ask further questions? Because if I do, if I say, well, tell me more about that. And they were talking about their experience of the fire and suddenly the person next to them wasn't thinking about that, but now is they might get a little triggered. And then the next person and the next person. So we have some tools that we can use like containing versus exploring. I can contain that. I can name what they just said. I can summarize it and I can move to the next person. Um, we can look at how do we recenter ourselves? How do we know what is triggering for us as the facilitator? Naming, it's like, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up if there's pushback about something. Um, looking at the garden plot instead of, you know, we have the, um, the parking lot. You ever do a training and somebody's like the parking lot and that's where every good idea goes to die because it never gets revisited again. <laughs> so we have garden plots where you put it there and it can, it's like a seed that can grow. So we have these ways to expect and be ready and to be realistic about uh, what the unplanned might be, what the discomfort might be. Um, Things like having a co-host, not doing it alone, um, pausing and pairing. When somebody says something, you're not sure what to say or do, you ask the group. And, and one of the things we don't have in here is transparency, is to name what it is that you are feeling in response to that. So um, there are strategies, but I am not a believer that you have to be clinically trained to be able to effectively do this. Thanks, Matt. 
All right, the next slide, and I know we're almost out of time. So we just wanted to bring up this concept of wellness communities. And this is a way that you can leverage people in your own organizations and build capacity. And we started this right um, at the outset of the pandemic where we put out to our organization who in this organization feels like they have the capacity and, and willingness to support a group of people on a regular basis. and. We had people pop up from all of our community and then they started some of their own groups or other people said they wanted some support. And it's really just, you know, there's no rules about it other than showing up for each other with regularity. And now we're on our second iteration where we're expanding that not just to wellness communities, but shared interest groups. We're gonna have a drive through yoga. We're gonna have a fitness group. And our organization has allowed us to host these um, you know, during work time. And so people can support each other and access care. And it's something that doesn't cost any money. And it's building a community of leaders. It's deepening our connections. And we're really hopeful um, that really good things will continue to come out of this. So if you have any questions about how you might do that in your organization, reach out and we can share what we've done so far. Okay, next slide. And this final quote, it is simple when we give attention to the ways in which we work together, connecting as deeply as we can and paying attention to the quality of the relationships between us, we produce good things. And that's by Chris Corrigan. So on the next slide, I think we just have our contact info. Oh, there's the resources and in the top is the one with the expanded slide deck. And then there's a whole bunch of other resources on there. And the next one has our contact information. And in closing, what I would like you to do is if you could just share a word or two of hope for healing our community into the chat box. I would love to see that right now. Oh, I love what we're seeing in the chat. Sandra and Matt, um, thank you so, so much. And I am hearing from people that it might be good to do a follow-up session. There's so many great resources that you shared. And if you would be willing to do so, let's try to schedule a follow-up yes. session where we can dive in deeper and create some dialogue. Would you be open to do that? You mean people can't do this after me, us talking for 30 minutes? <laughs> what? You planted the seeds. Let's uh, let's help that grow. So thank you thank so you. so much. Thank you, everyone. I don't know about you, but when Sandra said she get re she gets requests for Matt to come and talk to people all the time, I sent him a chat and said I'm ready for you to come and talk to me. So um, <laughs> I love the conversation and the resource that we have right here in our community. And thank you so much.